Let me know if you just write that. Okay, hopefully, hopefully the microphone's working. Um, I'll look, I'll look once we get started. Okay, folks, uh, welcome to the Otter Tail County uh, Septic Homeowner and, and Drinking Water uh, Well uh, Homeowner Education class. We have uh, Sarah Hager with the University of Minnesota and Jeff, what's your last name? Google? Google with the State Health Department that are going to talk about septics and wells for uh, homeowners in Otter Tail County. Couple things I want to go over. Uh, I'm with um, my name is Chris Leclerc. I'm the department head for the Land and Resource Management Office at Otter Tail County. Uh, there's four programs that we administer for the for the county. Uh, the first is we do wetland conservation. So any wetland uh, violations in the county, we have staff that look into those and uh, make sure wetlands aren't being filled in. We also do septic system regulation countywide to protect our groundwater resource. We do shoreline management, so any activity within a thousand feet of a lake or 300 feet of a river. We issue permits and make sure that we're not harming surface water. And then we also have a very robust AIS or Aquatic Invasive Species Program. If you've done any fishing in the county and gone to a public access, you may have run into one of my AIS inspectors who makes sure that your boat doesn't have zebra mussels or Eurasian milfoil or any other type of Aquatic Invasive Species. So if you've done any fishing in the county, you've probably ran into it. Those are the four program areas we administer for the county. Um, a couple things I want to talk about real quick. We did get a grant this year for $3 million to loan out to homeowners who have septic systems that are not compliant. So the way that system works is if you've been ordered by the county to replace your septic system, you could qualify for a loan. And the way it works is we essentially pay for the cost of your system to be installed, and then we take that cost and we assess it to your property taxes, and you pay it on your property taxes for 10 years with 0% interest. This isn't a money-making thing for the county. It's just a way to help people defray the cost of a septic system repair or replacement, which can be relatively expensive. So if you're at the point where you need to replace your system and the county says you have to replace your system, that money is available to you. We also have a low interest grant, uh, or not low interest, a low income grant. Uh, so if your income threshold is below a USDA standard, uh, we'll pay for up to 50% of the cost of that system, up to $5,000. And then lastly, as part of this class, we're gonna have well kits available today. And the well kits are also gonna be available at the office in Fergus Falls at the Government Service Center. Uh, well kits will be available this week. The only caveat is you have to conduct the test and get the kits dropped off to our office by 10 a.m. on Monday, August 17th, because the lab that is doing the analysis for us will be picking them up at that time. So it's a one-time thing. You just got to drop it off on Monday the 17th by 10 a.m., and then it's a free it's a free well. And I think is it just is it called for bacteria and nitrates? Just a basic sanitary analysis and arsenic. And arsenic. Oh, good. Good. So that's an added bonus. So if you're interested in that, there's kits on the on the uh, table out in the hallway. Otherwise, we'll have them available to our uh, residents uh, this week if you come and pick it up. We are live streaming this class uh, for people that want to sit at home and not uh, and, and want to continue practice social distancing. If you're on, I'm going to make sure that the sound is working. Uh, but Thank you for, for logging on, and with that, I will hand it over to Sarah. All right, for those of you watching online, I just took off my mask, and that's because I'm staying far away from everybody, but to talk for two hours with a mask on <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't work very well. So um, <clears throat> this course is going to focus on both protecting um, your septic system and your well, but what we're really focused on um, is protecting our water. So that's why we're gonna talk about having a good septic system and a good well. Um, the funding for this program actually came from, primarily from the Department of Health. 
Um, and it was, uh, and there's also some additional funding through the University of Minnesota, and then some directly through uh, the program that I work in, which is the on-site sewage treatment program. So Jeff and I are going to kind of split this up. I'm going to focus on the septic portion. Jeff is going to discuss the, the well portion of the material today. If you have a cell phone in the room, if you can uh, silence that. So what we're going to discuss today, we're going to start off talking about kind of what I consider to be a more new topic to many of us um, in Minnesota, and that is some new contaminants that we're thinking about out in the environment. So we refer to those as chemicals of emerging concern. Um, and that was actually the way that this funding was obtained was to educate more people about what some of these new chemicals of emerging concern are. But the good news is, is if you have a good septic system and a good well, you're actually going to be protecting yourself from chemicals of emerging concern, which we'll talk about. So, so we're going to spend most of our time talking about what is a good septic system, what's a good drinking water system, and then what you can do as a property owner to protect your, your system, which in turn, those two systems, which in turn is going to protect the environment. So first, again, I mentioned what are chemicals of emerging concern, and this picture kind of shows some of the things we're finding out in the environment. So whether it be pharmaceuticals, some of the dyes, um, flame retardants that are on things like carpeting and couches, and we're finding these things at trace amounts. Like we're not talking about a typical contaminant we're going to talk about later with wells is nitrate. We measure nitrate, and what the federal health standard is, it's 10 milligrams per liter. We're actually talking about finding these contaminants not in milligrams per liter, but in like parts per trillion. But if I asked you how much arsenic you wanted in your water, what would we say? Or atrazine. We usually want to say, well, I don't want any, right, if it's bad. But the fact is, is we are finding some of these trace amounts in our groundwater and in our surface water. And the challenging thing is we don't always have that health risk limit. We don't know at what level some of these trace contaminants are okay. So the kind of definition of what a chemical of emerging concern is, well, we all get the idea of what a contaminant is, right? It's something where it doesn't belong, right? So that's in our lake, in our drinking water. So these CECs are substances that we have found that are either in our ground or surface water, where we do not have a health-based limit, as I mentioned. They either pose a threat or they may, right? So we, I mentioned, for instance, so uh, if you have something, uh, a pesticide, well, again, we don't want a pesticide in our water, but if you go to a lake and take a sample, you may find a trace amount of a pesticide. The other thing you'll see is there's new or changing health information. So we are always gaining more information. So this includes pharmaceuticals, pesticides, industrial effluents, personal care products, things that we are washing down the drain. And some of those things are things, again, that we're using. If you think about the cleaners around our home, even some of the makeup we put on our faces, right? Some of the products we're using end up going down the drain. So why are we finding these things? Well, the biggest reason is that we are able to measure at levels we weren't able to measure at before. So, right, we're, we have much better analytical techniques to find these things. And we're looking for them, right? We may not have been looking for them before. Uh, we also have new substances every day. Like I think about like the aisle at Walmart or at your local hardware store and think about the cleaning lot aisle, right? How many more products we have that we, that we didn't have before? So. so examples again that we may use every single day, right? Things like DEET, right? Antibiotics, hormones, fragrances, chemotherapy drugs, right? So some, many of these things are things we need to use, right? We have to, um, we have to take often pharmaceuticals, right? But the question is, how do we make sure that those system, that our systems are protecting us from some of these trace contaminants? So that's really what we're gonna look at is, so now if we have a well on our property and we have a septic system, what's going on underneath our system? So if we have a good system, what is happening with most of these contaminants is they are either degrading in the soil or they are actually sorbing, which would mean like sticking to the soil. So for the most part, again, and there is always an exception. So for instance, they have found flame retardants are not very well treated in the soil. The soil microbes don't know how to break those things down, but 
we are finding that many of these contaminants are broken down. But septic systems weren't designed to necessarily treat flame retardants, right? They were really designed, number one, first and foremost, is to deal with bacteria and viruses, right? The things that make us sick. So, uh, so we'll get into that. So what is a good septic system? Well, it shouldn't be backing up into your home, which seems like an obvious thing, but uh, the system I grew up with, so I grew up on a, on a farm, a rural dairy farm, and about once a year, we would have laundry water that would show up in our basement. And that's how we knew when to get our tank pumped. That, that's, not, that's not actually a properly operating system though. Um, so that's not normal operation, and certainly that poses a risk. It also poses a huge inconvenience. Um, think about it, our basement wasn't finished, but think if it was, right? Now you would have sewage in your basement. Um, it should never be surfacing into, uh, onto the surface, so that would be in your yard, your neighbor's yard, um, into the grove of trees, right, or directly into a water body. And we still do have systems that uh, are referred to as straight pipe systems, where there is a pipe that leaves the structure, that goes into sometimes a tile line, and that tile line discharges into a water body. So it's not always that the pipe is running directly into the lake, but obviously those systems would pose both a, a public health threat, but also an environmental threat, because there's things in sewage that need treatment. So those are all pretty obvious. We can see those. The next two are a little harder. Uh, the one is, I don't if my septic tank is not watertight, so why would your septic tank not be watertight? Well, one, it could actually get a crack in it, right, or a hole, depending on the tank material. But what was more common in the 60s and 70s and even early 80s is tanks were installed that were designed to leak. They were either built out of blocks or bricks or silo staves, um, and they're just not watertight. And we do not want the effluent leaving the tank. It's usually too deep to get good treatment. So there are some existing tanks out there that are not watertight. The last one is, do you have enough soil separation? So for where the sewage is entering the soil to an, uh, a water table or bedrock, you need to have three feet of dry soil. And, and in particular, to treat the bacteria and viruses, you need that three feet. So these are the things we're gonna look at if they ever come out to do an inspection on your system. That we are, we, when we look at systems today and we say, well, is it a good system? We don't look at everything that would be required today. We don't look at, is there a manhole over the inlet of the tank, which is a new requirement. So what we're really looking at is, is the system protecting public health and the environment? So this is the definition of, of what a good system is. So what this might look at, like laid out in your backyard, well, we're going to start with the home, right? So that could be your home. It could be a restaurant. It could be a resort hooked up to a septic system. It then typically flows by gravity out of most people's homes. Sometimes if you have um, water uh, using devices in your basement, you may have a pump that pumps it up from the basement, uh, but usually most people have it flowing gravity into a septic tank. And then sometimes you may also then have gravity out to your drain field. Um, this will not be the case though if you have a mound system. So mound systems are required to have a pump and be pressurized. So uh, then it wouldn't be gravity. The good news about the pumps that are in mound systems though is generally speaking, they, they last a long time. Like you're talking about 10, 15 plus years before that pump's gonna need to be replaced because for most people it turns on once or twice a day and they're, they're good, reliable pumps. And most of us have a well pump, similar kind of lifespan um, in those systems. So I mentioned that three feet. So here you'll see an in-ground system so often called a trench, leach field, drain field. Um, so where we measure that is from the bottom of the system. So where the sewage goes into the soil, you're meeting your three feet. So I mentioned this is really important for bacteria and virus. It's also important for phosphorus, which is a really important nutrient if you live on a lake, river, stream, because the growth of algae or weeds in that lake is all related to how much phosphorus is available to feed it. So there's my soil treatment component. So looking a little bit at that septic tank, its primary job is to catch solids. So heavier things are going to settle out in the bottom of the tank and lighter things like oils and greases are gonna to float to the top. So it's kind of the first step in the treatment process and it needs to be working right because we don't want all of that stuff going out to the soil. To me, the soil is pretty amazing that it can eat up a lot of organic material, filter out things, but we do want to hold some of those back because there are also bacteria that will live in that septic tank 
that will break stuff down, right? So digestion starts in our guts, right? We start digesting and breaking down the food. The bacteria that were living in our guts, they continue that process of breaking down the food in the septic tank and then out in the soil. So here's what a modern septic tank looks like. And the reason I say that is, as you can see all of this. With a lot of our older systems, almost all of this is buried. I often go out to people's systems that were built, you know, built in the 90s and even in the early 2000s, sometimes you don't see anything. Certainly systems built in the 70s, right? They may not even sometimes, well, we're not sure. We think the tank is over here. With our new systems, what you'll see is everything's at grade, which makes maintenance so much easier. So water coming in from the house, on the way into the tank, you have what's called a baffle. The purpose of that baffle is to make sure that the sewage has time in that tank. So septic tanks are designed around retention time, how many days that the effluent has for treatment. So it comes in and it travels the length of this tank. Uh, then you'll have a baffle on the way out, and that one is even more important than the one on the way in because it makes sure that the scum that sits on the top of the tank doesn't leave the tank. A couple other things that you'll notice here on the way out, this tank has an addition that isn't on all systems. It's, it's more common on newer systems, and that is an effluent screen or an effluent filter that helps hold more solids back. It's a great thing to either add on or have in a new system because it keeps more solids back so your soil treatment system will last longer. So what's gonna happen over time, I mentioned, is you're gonna build up sludge and scum in the tank. The nice thing is the liquid that is leaving this tank is much cleaner. Over half of the solids either settle out or are decomposed in the septic tank. So here's just some pictures of those effluent screens I, were I was talking about. Um, these are always located under a manhole because we know we're gonna have to clean those. Right, so most commonly, people clean them once a year. That's very common then in the spring of the year, but I know people who just say, we're gonna do the spring and the fall because it makes us feel better, right? We're just gonna remember because if this screen were to plug up, and you can see that one, it's got some nice growth on it. Um, one, you could have an alarm that activated, some do, some don't, but if you didn't clean it and it got plugged up, you eventually could have sewage backing up, which we never want. So now moving on to that last component, it is the saturated soil conversation. This also could be bedrock. That's probably not super common here, but in other parts of Minnesota, if you've been along the North Shore and you see all that beautiful bedrock, they don't have a lot of soil there to work with. So they're, they're bringing it in because they don't have soil. Where we are today, right, in Ottertail, it's more likely because they don't actually have the dry soil that we need for treatment. So this shows what a mound system, all it really is is an elevated drain field. So we bring sand in. Sometimes I can ask, well, why do we use sand in a mound? Well, the nice thing about sand is you can take it from a pit here, right, and move it here, and it operates the same, right, because it doesn't have a lot of structure that keeps it stuck together. It's basically individual grains. So we, we, know, we can move it around, and we know what kind of treatment we're going to get out of that sand. So the kind of last overview topic I wanted to hit on is how septic systems really do an amazing job at treating the contaminants that we put down the drain. And just for reference, when we look at the main things that are in our wastewater that are bad, the pathogens, the solids, the nutrients, um, a septic system is going to treat that water to a higher level than a wastewater treatment plant is going to discharge. The water is really clean coming out of them. It's not perfect. We'll talk a little bit about nitrogen in particular. But they do a really good job. And the number one reason is because of all the activity going on in the soil. Soil microbes do an amazing job. So, so we'll walk through each of these. Um, when we look in a house, it is important that all of the different uh, water streams go into the septic system. So uh, sometimes when people got their first real washing machine that wasn't a ringer, people thought, oh, it's just laundry water. I can run that out on the surface. Well, there's a reason why we wash our clothes, right? They're dirty. <laughs> yeah, so both uh, bacteria and viruses, soaps and cleaners. So it is important that all the water be connected into the septic system. So where are the contaminants treated? So we'll walk through with each of them. Most of the treatment happens, though, in the soil. So the septic tank I mentioned is particularly going to remove some of the solids, but it's not going to deal with the bacteria and viruses. That's really going to happen out in the drain field. 
So what are, this is the, the concerning thing is that when we are sick, right, we are shedding back bacteria and viruses and we don't necessarily know all the time when we have a cold or the flu or whatever it might be. So we generally are going to just look for the sign of bacteria from our guts, right? So if there's but gut bacteria, uh, that means that uh, there could be also bacteria and viruses that make us sick. So these bacteria and viruses have difficulty living in an oxygen-rich environment because they really started in our guts. They went through a septic tank that was anaerobic too. So when they're exposed to oxygen in an aerobic environment, they're not able to thrive in that environment. So moving on to the solids, the solids that are in wastewater are primarily digested and undigested animal and vegetable material. It also, there are also some in synthetic organic compounds, which can be in some of our cleaners in our homes. These organic solids take oxygen to break down. So if you, again, had wastewater directly running into a water body, it would suck the oxygen out of that lake or that river, which we don't want. That's very, very difficult on the aquatic species living in that water. So because it lowers the DO. So how we deal with it is some of these solids are going to settle out in the septic tank and be removed when the tank is pumped. Um, an effluent screener filter would help hold more of those solids back. But finally, some of this organic material is going to get out to the soil and the soil microbes are going to come to eat it. It's kind of like the picnic. You don't invite the ants, they just show up. Same with the soil microbes. Once we start spreading that sewage out, we grow a bacterial community that's, that will eat up the organic material that's in the wastewater. So there's also inorganic solids. These are a little harder because organic solids can be eaten by the natural soil bacteria. Some of these inorganics can. not So fibers from synthetic clothing, which should be coming off with your lint in your washing machine, um, minerals, metals, and salts from soil material, your plumbing, makeup. These things, again, are not subject to decay, meaning they're going to build up. They cause the clouding of water, which is called turbidity. Um, and if they make it out to your drain field, whatever soil treatment system you have, over time they can cause it to clog. So it is one of the reasons why eventually every septic system is going to need to be replaced, right? They don't last forever, and this is one of the reasons. So the tank helps, right, because we have that settling occurring. Here's another benefit of having a filter, right, because the filter would help hold more of those solids back. But over time, it can cause the clogging of the soil pores. So moving on to the nutrients. So when we see this, right, when we see algae like that, that growth of algae is tied to, to phosphorus. We are one of the sources. When we look at a water body, we are not the only, us as humans, right? There's also fertilizer spread on fields that contain phosphorus, but we eat animals and vegetables, right, that have phosphorus in them. And we don't eat it all, so we excrete it primarily in our urine. If you were putting food down the drain directly, you would also be adding phosphorus into the system. There's a few household cleaners that still contain phosphoric acid. It is not in our laundry soap. We took it out. Uh, but sometimes you'll still see it in dishwashing detergent. So anything that bubbles around your house that's a soap, you want to confirm that it doesn't have phosphorus in it. The good thing is our septic systems and the soil in particular has a strong affinity to grab onto the phosphorus as the wastewater is trickling through the soil. So it really gets at the mineral makeup of the soil, the soil surface, but a, a septic system again that has three feet of unsaturated treatment, dry soil is going to do a good job at absorbing that phosphorus. So moving on to the other big nutrient is nitrogen. So nitrogen comes from us again. We are the number one source of nitrogen uh, coming down the drain directly from our urine because we, we consume more nitrogen than we need. It has two potential impacts. Here in the Midwest, our biggest impact is to our drinking water. So if it reaches uh, a groundwater source uh, that someone's going to drink, that number can't be over 10 for nitrate. And Jeff's going to talk a lot more about this when we talk about wells. The issue is, is that we have variable removal. And what I mean by that is some septic systems do a better job at, re at treating nitrate and nitrogen in the system. 
Um, it is also the reason why we have a setback from our septic system to our well, is to allow for some dilution. Finally, though, there are systems that can meet the federal drinking water standard before it hits the soil. That we could actually design a system that when it goes into the ground, it's already below 10. So those are more likely to be required in environments that are sensitive or, or we're seeing more of these being used is on big systems, on cluster systems, when we have a lot more water going into the soil, or people who live on the ocean. Because the growth of algae, I don't know if you've been here about the red tides in Florida of algae, their growth of algae in the ocean is limited by how much nitrogen there is, not how much phosphorus there is. So there are technologies out there, but they are quite expensive. So now you're talking about 20, 30, sometimes even $40,000 for a new septic system to treat nitrogen to those levels. So the last one, and the reason why, again, why, why this whole training started was what about all these chemicals? So what about cleaners and medicines that are going down the drain? Are we treating those? Um, they can, in large amounts, harm your septic system. So um, I remember years ago, I had to take an antibiotic. And when I went in, this was more than 10 years ago, the doctor told me, when you take the antibiotic, that I should eat some yogurt. And I didn't even, at the time, think about what she was saying. And now we've all heard the term probiotic, right? So the reason why she was telling me to eat yogurt is the antibiotic was going to kill off all my good gut bacteria, that I need to digest my food. Well, the same thing can happen in the septic tank. If you put a lot of things down the drain that kill bacteria, so an antibiotic would be example, so would bleach, right? Anything that's gonna kill off a lot of bacteria in large amounts can be harmful. Not in, not in normal, so and it always gets to be, well, what's normal usage? So I had a cabin owner once who told me that, they, that the way they were managing their toilets was they were dumping a half a gallon of bleach in there to clean that's not normal usage, right? A cup of bleach and a white load once a week, you're not gonna kill all, all the bacteria. So some of it is a little common sense, but what I also tell people is just think about, do you really need to use some of those products that we know are antibacterial? So there's laundry soap right now that is advocating and promoting that it kills 99.9% .9 of the bacteria on our clothing. On our clothing. And this, this came out because of the environment we're living in now with COVID. So is that something that healthcare workers might need who are working in a hospital with COVID patients? I, I think the answer to that is yes. Is that something that the average Minnesota resident needs? In my opinion, no, right? <laughs> but that's a whole nother conversation. But is thinking about the products we use and how it could be impacting our septic system. So how they're treated again, some of them could be stored. Um, this is the variable removal that I mentioned. Um, there's more and more research being gathered that is showing that many of these contaminants are being treated in our septic system, but it's also not bulletproof, that there are potentially some trace amounts of things that are passing through um, to our groundwater. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff, who's going to talk about a big drinking water system, and at the end, I'm going to come back and talk about maintenance in relation to septic systems. No, I think I can get it back in a slideshow. I don't know how that. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, uh, thank you again for all coming today, and thanks for the online people for showing up and doing the video. And uh, here to talk about uh, wells and groundwater and what our department does is we license the well drillers. We work with groundwater con uh, quality, uh, well construction, groundwater protection. Um, my office here is in Fergus Falls, so it's relatively close. Um, so I'd like to talk today about what is a good drinking water system. Uh, today's topics include, are gonna include well construction and what typically a well will look, look, look like, groundwater protection, and what we can do to protect the groundwater and your well's water quality, and then water testing. 
Uh, this is a picture of a typical new well construction. It has four inch diameters, steel casing coming up to the ground. Uh, oftentimes plastic cases more commonly used. Um, it has a, it has a, the casing extends one foot above ground, has a cap with a gasket to cover on there. And then it has a well identification tag here with a six digit number that has, you can look, use to look up to find information about the well. And um, yeah, typically this is what they look like. Some of the older wells you're going to see are going to look like this. You have a jet pump on here, a couple pipes going into the well, this is a single pipe jet here going in. You're often going to find these inside of maybe into a, on a house or maybe in, in a basement or a pump house or a basement offset possibly. Uh, here's a picture of either, it could either be a dug well or a well that was constructed in a pit. Both dug wells and uh, pit wells are considered, so considered uh, susceptible to contamination. Dug wells typically have very little watertight casing, so water seeps in through the side walls of the, of the well or in through the bottom, and you get very little filtration from the soil for surface contamination. Wells that are in pits are prone to flooding, and they tend to accumulate debris so that we don't allow wells and pits any longer. Uh, well construction methods, some of the most common methods are uh, mud rotary construction. I'll get into that a little bit here as we go on. Uh, some contracts do use air rotary and some do use, still use cable tool. Uh, this is a, a depiction of what you would see if, you, if you're able to look under the soil. Uh, the, Top layer is either a dry sand or possibly a contaminated layer of sand that's present on the site. The gray layer is a, depicted a clay confining layer, which prevents water from moving down into the aquifer. The blue layer here is a water barrier formation or the aquifer where they're going to set the well screen to get water for your well. And if you drill deep enough, typically you're going to find a bedrock, which is a consolidated rock that's very hard. And uh, usually around here, they'll stop drilling when they hit that because they no longer can use water. It is used in certain areas of the state too as, as a water source, so it can be used, but in this general area, it's not commonly used. So there will be your house sitting on your property. What's going to happen? What the well contractor is going to do is going to come in with the well drilling rig. He's going to set up this derrick, and he's going to drill down to a certain depth where he feels he can obtain a good source of water. Um, so that was pretty quick. So let's just go into a little bit more detail on that. Again, there's your formation. He's gonna come in and drill down to the aquifer. Put your plan where you're gonna do the aquifer. And he's gonna research these drilling fluids to clean out any cuttings as a ground up during the drilling process. After he's cleaned out enough of the drilling cuttings, he will remove his drill stem and insert well casing and a screen. The screen is going to allow water to go in, into the well. The well casing is going to prevent the surface water from getting into the well. Next thing will happen is they'll put sand around the screen. This sand will work as a filter pack to uh, filter out different size of uh, sands and silts and other materials. On top of that, they'll put a seal, typically it's a magnite clay seal, that'll prevent uh, any of the sealing material from getting into the, into the sand pack around the well. Then they'll insert a pipe along the outside, and they will pump in a, a material which we call grout. It's basically a non-porous material. It doesn't allow water movement through it, so during the construction, they will drill a hole that's approximately seven to eight inches in diameter. You're sticking a four inch pipe inside of that, so you're gonna have this annular space from the outside. So we really wanna get that sealed up to prevent surface water from draining from the ground surface along the outside of the casing and down into the aquifer. Then they'll just pull that pipe out, that's done. We talked a little bit about um, uh, well development. Well development is basically using compressed air and jetting water into out through the screen, into the groundwater, and into the formation to get the fines materials that were deposited during the drilling process. Once those materials are out of there, that sand that is 
it's a sorted sand. It's more coarse. <coughs> it gets to be more coarse along the length of the screen <coughs> than it is on the outside of here. And then it works to filter out uh, some of the sand particles and the silt particles. <coughs> Just like to go over a few more terms here. Brown water is water that's contained in soil and bedrock. An aquifer, as we talked about, is soil or rock that stores and transmits water. And a clay combining layer is soil or rocks that restrict water movement. We did touch a little bit on those during the well construction, but those are kind of an overview of the important terms that make it easier to understand what we're talking about. Um, I'd like to take a step back a little bit and go over the hydrologic cycle. Um, I think everybody's aware that when it rains or snows around here, it falls on the topography of the land. You'll, what you see is the overland water movement from the hillsides going down the hillsides, accumulating the lakes and ponds and rivers, and eventually making it up to the ocean. What we don't see is what's happening below the ground surface. And it, it kind of is the same, similar thing that's going on. Water is being infiltrated on the higher levels and, and the lower levels too. In the higher levels, it will hit the water table and then it will start going horizontally over to a point of discharge usually a lake, river, pond, or stream, and eventually it'll get back out to the ocean, just like the surface went off below. So that's important to, to know because you can't see that, that that's occurring. As far as this, um, this depicts uh, two different wells on the property. One well is here, one well is here. As we talked about uh, the groundwater movement, it'll move from an area of high elevation to a layer of area of low elevation. So this well, since it's at a lower elevation than its potential source of contamination, it is more susceptible to contamination compared to this well up here, which is upgrading. That's why when we're replacing well, we do like to see wells put at a higher elevation than the sewer systems or any other potential source of contamination because of that fact. If you look over here too, there's an abandoned well that's no longer being used. Abandoned wells bypass the normal filtering capabilities of the soil. They lead to, they can become a uh, place of disposal for different things, and they can lead to groundwater contamination if they're not properly sealed. And what we require, being when we say properly sealed, they, all wells need to be sealed by a licensed well contractor, and they need to be sealed with a material that doesn't allow water movement through it. Again, you're looking at a bentonite clay or a neat cement grout, which is a stuff it reduces the water movement. This is just a depiction of what uh, the set, normal setback distances for contamination to wells are. This is in the owner's guide, which is available for the participants that are here. Um, you can look at this online if you're interested in that. So a little bit of ground, groundwater contamination. Uh, water easily dissolves contaminants on the ground and it, it carries them downward. Um, shallow wells and wells near, near contamination sources have the potential to be contaminated. And nitrate is one of the more common, evenly controlled groundwater contaminants because it, it readily moves with the ground, the, with, or with, this, with the water. Um, typically nitrate has a negative charge and soil particles have negative charge so they don't stick very well to each other so it flows pretty well with the groundwater. The good news is most of the soil does do a good job of filtering out most other chemicals. Uh, there are, as we talked about, clay confining layers, which prevent the downward movement of contamination. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about wells and plumbing and maintenance and what you can do as a homeowner to uh, maintain the integrity of your well and the, the longevity of your well. Uh, any well that has a submersible pump, and most newer wells all have submersible pumps, they will have electrical conduit that goes down there to feed the electricity to the pump to produce the water. Uh, that will entail having electrical wire run through this electrical conduit into the cap and then down into the well to the pump. All three of these things have the same electrical conduit, and you'll notice that all three of these are broken. The reason they're broken is they probably got hit by a lawnmower or some sort of other vehicle or maybe a weed trimmer or something that um, did that. What this does is it, it creates a break in the system so that contamination can get in there. 
And when I say contamination, I'm talking about bugs, including, including Asian beetles, grasshoppers, spiders, uh, earwigs, things like that. Um, all walls are also required to be vented. Uh, a vent, what will happen is when the pump kicks in, it'll draw the water down and create a vacuum. And if there was, a, if there was not a vent there, so the vent basically equal, equilibrates that pressure and uh, so it well functions and it doesn't create a negative pressure. The other thing is, is that um, it will vent off any dissolved gases that are in the water. As you look at these wells, this has a screen vent. They're all required to be downturned. And then there's a screen in here. This cap right here is actually no longer allowed by the well code. It was removed from the requirements in uh, 1993. It has an overlapping cover. Basically, it's a cover that sits on top of the pipe. And it is a vent, but it's not a screen vent, so things can crawl up inside of there. Uh, as far as casing protection, as we talked about a little bit, uh, lawnmowers and, and vehicles can damage the casing. Uh, casings can get damaged during the construction process, too. Um, if you look in here, this wall casing is cracked right there. Uh, and this can crawl in there. This well casing is flush with the top of the soil here, so that, remember, there's a vent in there. It's not a watertight cap, it's a vented cap, so that if you have a lot of rainfall or snow melt, water can seep in through that vent and get into the water, into the well. On this one, probably what happens is this well cap is not attached very well to the casing, and frost can grab these things and lift them up during the freeze, freeze off process during the winter months. Again, I just want to emphasize how important it is to maintain the integrity of the wellhead because if you don't, um, bugs and beetles and things like that, larger critters can get into the well if the hole is big enough. As far as vulnerability of flooding, uh, wells that are in well pits are, are prone to flooding. They can, uh, depending on what elevation they're at, some are high and dry, some are low and wet. So. We do not allow wells and well pits anymore for that reason. If you if you have a, a well a well casing here that's close to the surface water, you want to make sure that there's adequate drainage away from the, from the well so that surface water both doesn't go over the top of the well or affect the well from the ground surface. Um, also inside your house, there's some things to look for. Plumbing cross connections are one of them. Uh, the most common one is your, your water softener line that comes out of the water softener, it drains into the sewer system typically. Um, now, sometimes the, the uh, water softeners are, have their own sewer system, so it's not quite as critical on those systems. But here you can see the, uh, the discharge for the uh, water softeners so directly into the sewer pipe. Bacteria from the sewer pipe can work their way back in through there into the water softener your water system. Here the drain is into the into floor drain which also accumulate bacteria. Solutions to that, those two things are here is that it's hard to see here. It's a pipe coming up here with it. It comes up and around and then discharges going straight down, providing an air gap so bacteria can't get into there. This system here depicts its, its own dedicated drain. Uh, this pipe really just goes out to the yard, I'm not sure if it's into a gravel pocket or to the ground surface, but either way, it is not hooked up to the sewer system, so the potential for contamination is reduced. The other thing to look for is uh, is a uh, boiler chemical or boiler system hooked up in line. Oftentimes, boiler systems will be hooked up in line to use makeup water if the systems are uh, become below and system pressure goes down. And that's fine, long as you have some sort of a backflow prevention on it. Um, there's one right here, and that'll prevent the boiler chemicals from getting into your plumbing, into your water supply. I'd like to talk a little bit about water testing. Uh, we always recommend that you get your water tested at a certified lab. Uh, as we talked about earlier, there's test kits available for sulfur bacteria, nitrate, and arsenic. And that's what we recommend unless you suspect other things. Uh, so oftentimes people ask me, well, what should I get my water tested for? And that, those are the three things we recommend. 
Well, what about agricultural chemicals? Well, do you think that you have agricultural chemical use in the area? And what chemicals are you looking at primarily for testing? Because it can get kind of expensive if you uh, are not, if you don't know what you're looking for. Jeff, why yeah. does naming the Well, both nitrates and manganese. I'll talk a little bit about that here as we go through each individual contaminant. Um, and they, they both cause a little different effects on the babies. So in order to find a laboratory, you can contact your local public health or environmental health services office. You can call our office. We have district offices throughout the state. Or you can do a Google search um, by well testing results and options. And that will bring you to the Minnesota Department of Health website and um, you'll be able to find the information that you need there right from within our office. Uh, coal from bacteria, this is one of the first contaminants I like to talk about. Basically, any, any level of coal from bacteria is uh, unacceptable. Coal from bacteria act as an indicator organism saying there's something wrong with the system. Coal from bacteria should be present there. Why is it there? Was it introduced during a repair? Was it introduced during a crack or something in your wall casing? Or, or, or you know, was your casing bumped during it when something moved on and, and something got in there? So you want to eliminate all coal from bacteria because they can be the indicator. Something's wrong. If you do have coal from bacteria, you will want to disinfect the system. Uh, there are directions for, on our website to do that. Typically, most commonly, just regular household, household bleach is used to disinfect the uh, water supply systems. But you got to be a little careful. You want to get through the whole plumbing system in addition to your well, plus uh, into the pressure tank and a full pocket, full water lines. And we do have a pretty detailed uh, disinfection procedure on our website. So we're getting the question of nitrate. Nitrate is a uh, contaminant that's harmful for infants under the age of six months. The drinking water standard set at 10 parts per million. And the sources are agriculture or agricultural or lawn fertilizers, uh, human or animal waste are another source of it. Um, they mainly affect infants under the age of six months because their systems are not developed fully. Um, infants under the age of six months aren't like adults. They're, they're, they're different and, and they can cause a blue baby syndrome, which is the inability for the baby's hemoglobin to transfer oxygen from the lungs to the baby's tissues. And you, it's called blue baby syndrome because what happens is when the oxygen is not in the tissues, the tissues become tinged, kind of bluish your fingertips and your nail beds and things like that become blue from that. Um, we do test every new well that is constructed in Minnesota for nitrates. And here on the left-hand side is the area where we're finding some elevated nitrates in newer wells. The map on the left-hand side is a map put together by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. They did a random or sort of a targeted sampling of nitrate in uh, agricultural areas where they had high intensity of row crops and sandy coarse grain soils. So in those areas, you can see down here and a few areas along here, there's a little bit more susceptibility or a little bit more nitrate uh, detection in those areas. Um, what, what do you do if you do have an elevated nitrates? Um, you get your drinking water from a safe source, first of all. Don't give the water to the infants under the age of six months. Inspect your drinking water supply and see if there's a source of contamination close to the well that needs to be removed. Um, and consider, you can consider drilling a new well, a newer, deeper well. Sometimes the shallower wells are more susceptible to nitrate contamination than the deeper, more protected wells. Uh, second item we'd like to talk about is arsenic. Arsenic is present Pretty much everywhere in the state of Minnesota. The question is, is will it release from the soil particles and get into your drinking water or not? And that's based on the geochemical chemistry of the water and the soils. Um, drinking water standard is set at 10. 
it is a risk for drink, drinking the water over a long period of time. It could increase the uh, will increase your risk of cancer, the lungs, bladder, and liver, reduce intelligence in children, diabetes, and heart disease. And as we talked about it, it, it is normally naturally occurring in this area, came in on the glaciers tens of thousands of years ago and crossed in this area. There are some areas, and one of them would be up in Perm, where there's an arsenic dump. Aside from back in the 1930s or 1940s, um, they were used for grasshopper bait. They would lace the grasshopper bait with arsenic, and that would kill the grasshoppers. But when all the grasshoppers are gone, they had excess bait laced with arsenic, so they buried it, and now there's a, uh, a site cleanup occurring up in Perm. Um, what do you do? Um, as far as where the arsenic has been determined, detected, again, here we're looking at new well construction. There's West Central Minnesota is kind of a hot area for increased arsenic concentrations. Also, Central Minnesota here is another area for new wells and arsenic. The map on the left just depicts about where arsenic is de detected and it's, it's depicted by county. So it's very similar to West Central Minnesota, Central Minnesota, and then you do have a few areas here where you the higher arsenic concentrations. Um, there are two different forms of arsenic. There's an arsenic-3 and an arsenic-5, and I'm not going to get into too much detail there. But reverse osmosis will remove uh, almost 95% of the arsenic-5 and about 65% of arsenic-3. So it depends on what kind of arsenic you have in your water and how effective reverse osmosis will work. But typically, reverse osmosis does do a pretty good job and it will at least reduce what you have there. Um, you could use distillation or you could use some sort of an absorptive medium where the arsenic sticks to the media. It's an iron oxide typically is the most common. Lead, lead comes from uh, typically not in the ground, found in groundwater. It is introduced during the uh, construction process. Either you have lead pipes, you have lead solder or brass fittings and you fixtures that have lead components to it. Um, it does affect infants under uh, six years primarily, and um, pregnant women are highest at risk. It has all kinds of health effects for young children. Um, as we talked about, you know, it comes from lead pipes, lead solder, brass components, and faucets that valves. Lead packers above the well screen have been used in the past, but they're no longer being used and other plumbing connections. Um, typically, if you do have a, a component in your system that does have lead in it, the lead accumulates in the water surrounding that. Say you have a lead pipe or some solder in your system that has lead in it. As the water sits there, it will dissolve the lead out of the, out of the solder. And then, uh, and, and, but the longer it sits there, the, more, the higher the concentration is. So if you go to work, come for six to eight hours, come back, you're going to have a higher concentration of lead in that area than if you would be using it throughout the day. So that's why we recommend to let the uh, water run for 30 to 60 seconds before you consume the water. Always use cold water for drinking and cooking. If possible, replace the plumbing system or the component that you uh, feel is the source of the lead. And you can also try some home treatment if you really want to, and you recommend flushing the system, it's probably the safest and most reliable way to do things. Manganese, we had briefly talked about, it is a uh, concern for babies under the age of one year. The drinking water standard for them, uh, for that age group, is 100 micro micrograms per liter, and for adult population, it's 300 micrograms per liter. Um, manganese is typically associated with iron. If you have high iron, Oftentimes you have high manganese, and if you have high manganese, you have oftentimes have high iron. Uh, manganese will stain your fixtures. If you're getting stain in your fixtures, if it's red, typically it's going to be iron. If it's black staining, it's going to be manganese. So that just kind of gives you a visual as far as what you could be looking for. Um, the risk is not from drinking the water on a one-time basis. It's over, again, over longer periods of time. And again, that's naturally occurring just like iron is and arsenic is in the, in the soil on the rocks. 
we don't have uh, we don't do regular testing for manganese in, in water or in wells that are constructed. So we don't have a real good map. Uh, this map depicts where the incidence of arsenic is likely. So we're looking western Minnesota again and southwest Minnesota. Um, so if you do have high elevated manganese, you want to make sure that you're just not making them formulas and juices for your children under the age of one, one year for sure. You could uh, do home water treatment, water softeners, remove iron, they're going to remove manganese too. Um, and uh, some carbon pictures and distillation also work. I'd like to go over a little bit about water sampling. Um, you want to collect the water sample when you use your test kits. You want to collect it as close as you can to the well. Again, use a regulated use faucet. You definitely want to use it before the treatment device. And if you can't get a sample collected before the treatment device, you want to uh, uh, bypass the treatment device and flush it out. Uh, you want to disinfect the, the faucet if possible. Remove the aerators. The faucets will have aerators with the rubber uh, washers in there. You don't want to flame the rubber washers because it'll melt them. But um, if you can't get if you can't get a flame to the faucet, you can disinfect with rubbing up all. Jeff, what about the hydrant? You can't sample from a hydrant if that's uh, your only source. Most of those are ahead of Correct. The they can be a source of false contamination. So if you do get a bacteria positive test off of that, you can either take the initiative and disinfect your system because it's not difficult to do, and it's not very expensive to do. Otherwise, you can question the water sample and resample re from a different place to confirm that that's actually a valid test. And prior to testing, you just want to run, let the water run for five minutes or so. So um, we talked a little bit about contamination, how it can enter your well, and what's a good, reliable source of water. Um, as far as the sources of the contamination, we talked about groundwater, uh, talked about arsenic, nitrate, manganese, things that are in the groundwater that can get into your water supply. We talked about broken or inadequate well construction, such as damaged well cases, damaged vents, or uh, Insects and, and different things eat inside your well. Um, we talked about plumbing components such as lead in your system, and then plumbing cross connections that can be uh, eliminated uh, and possibly a source of cold from bacteria. So, to su kind of summarize as far as what to remember as far as a safe, reliable source of water, we recommend that you go by the acronym TIPS. Test your water, inspect your well, protect your well, and then seal any unused wells that are in the area. If you do these things, you should have a relatively safe and viable source of water. Um, I often get calls as far as well information. How can I find more information on my well? There's a couple different ways. Either you can call our office and we can look up the information up if we have it. The other thing, place you can go is you can go on to Minnesota Well Index. The Minnesota Well Index has a, uh, a listing of all of the uh, wells that we have records on, and it will give you basic construction information. It will give you the geology on most of the records. It will give you the well depth and what type of pumps in there. You, then once you get in there, you can search by your, if you, have the, if you have the well identification number, or if you have the address, or if you have a township range section, and then you can go through there and look for that. Sure. Okay. Uh, question is how close should a well be to a septic system? And uh, we, we did briefly, the well owner's handbook has some distances in there, the required distances, but typically for a deeper, more protected well, it's, it's 50 feet to the drain field, 50 feet to the septic tank, and then sewer lines, they're, depending on if they're, how they're constructed, is either 20 or 50 feet. Uh, 
Uh, well, that would be a good question for the Ottershell County people because we don't work directly with Drainfield and we do rely on them for their expertise in being able to do that. And I have often asked the same question and it's where I go to get the answer or to a sewer contractor. Yeah, typically, the county keeps pretty good record of um, septic system permits and as built. So a lot of times the permit record will give you a good indication where your septic system is. Um, if you don't see the white pipes out in your yard, a lot, you know, most of the time the white pipes are an indication at least where the trenches start. And then you just have to follow a line, in, you know, along with the contour to find the other end. Um, so Jeff, I have a question about buried suction lines. Sure. For years, ordinances required a 50 foot setback to a buried suction line. But when we were revising our ordinance, we talked to Pat Sarah Foley and down in St. Paul. And he said that's a relic from the plumbing code in the 80s and that a 50 foot setback to a buried suction line is no longer appropriate. The 10 foot is just like a pressurized line at that point, the 10 foot setback is fine. Actually, there is no, we in our rules, we don't have any separation distance. You don't? Okay. And the reason is, is we don't allow buried suction lines. Okay. Okay. So we say, um, if you're going to put in a new system, you cannot put in a new buried suction line. Um, because they are prone to, if they do, if they do, if there's a defect in the integrity of the pipe, it could suck in surface water. Right. And uh, I know Ottertail County had a had that 50 foot setback distances, yeah. and um, that was removed based on Pat Sarah recommendation. Sure. And um, so that's what we're we're at. We never we haven't allowed them for a long, long time. So we haven't had a setback distance to something. Okay. Yes. Was in a, a water testing a, a few weeks ago. There was a, a sampling that was scheduled in Otter Tail, and uh, I've heard that information that came out said it wouldn't matter if your sample was taken before or after the sophomore. So I was, uh, you said no, it's different. So if they do. If we do the well testing, testing now, it should be before the software. Yeah, it should be before the software. I don't know exactly. I would have to look. Okay, nitrate testing. Probably is not a big concern with nitrate testing because the water software is not going to remove any nitrate. Um, yeah, it yeah. Um, that's where I typically take my samples from, um, or the pressure tank. I don't, I just don't like taking it from the pressure tank because you get some of the um, some of the settling of some you know, debris that might come off that sample. Yeah. And oftentimes, they're lower to the ground, they're dirt. You know, the close to the floor, things get slopped up there sometimes, and you get false contamination. Oh, yeah. um, they do have an outside course. Yeah, I would say I don't even know if disinfectant that would be necessary. Right? As long as you run the water out of that in five minutes, you're gonna flush anything that's sitting there out, right? That's a general rule, yes. If, if, if you can absolutely get it disinfected. You still can collect the sample, and if, you, if everything turns out, if the bacteria turns out negative, you're good to go. If it turns out positive, you might have to scratch your head a little bit and say, well, should I have disinfected that or not? And I probably should collect another sample. Yeah. Torch to it, yep. If, if there's no rubber washes in there, to know. Yep. Yep. Good questions, thank you. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you for your time and your attention. All right, so we'll uh, now finish it up talking about maintenance uh, related to septic systems. So kind of where uh, Jeff left off is talking about, do you actually know what is in your backyard? So that's the number one thing if you're going to manage your septic system is to actually know what you have. Do you have one tank or do you have multiple tanks? 
So many people have multiple tanks, and so you may have more pipes in your yard. It may not all make sense. Do you have an effluent filter? Do you have a pump? You have a pump, you have an alarm. So where is all that located? Is it all operating properly? So you should review your design or ask built. You may be like, well, I don't have that. That's again where you should reach out to the county and see what's in your permit record because they probably have a record of what is in your backyard. It may not be 100% accurate because sometimes those drawings were done, the system went in, it may not match perfectly, but it gives you a good idea of what's actually below the ground. So you want to contact your county or your permitting authority. Um, some people who, particularly online, might actually be part of the Otter Tail Management District may actually keep records for a bunch of properties um, in the area. And if all of that fails, if you have an installer or if you have someone who's regularly servicing your system, they can probably explain to you what's in your backyard. And that is something to consider is the next time you are having service on your system is to actually be there. Um, to ask them how your system is working. It's kind of like when you go get your oil changed. Uh, the last time I did it, before winter, uh, the guy mentioned to me that my tires were getting a little bald. And I hadn't noticed that because I don't look at my tires, right? And that was really good information for me because then I knew going into winter, ah, it's time to get new tires. So the, the same thing can happen with your septic system and they can look at it and actually give you some advice about how the system is currently working, how much life you might have left in it, or simply what's in the ground. So now moving into maintenance. So maintenance is mandatory. So we have had a state code for septic systems since 1996, and that code has always said you had to take care of your system. I think what has changed is one, people have gotten, I would just say, more aware that they need to do maintenance. And also we're having more and more jurisdictions that are actually tracking maintenance to make sure that we're protecting our systems. Because when we're protecting our septic systems and taking care of them, we're protecting our groundwater and we're protecting our lakes and, and our rivers. So during this visit, they are going to clean your tank. That's what most people focus on. They should also, if you had an effluent screen, they're obviously going to clean that too. If you have an alarm on your pump, I think it's a great time to confirm that it works. So it's a float that when the water level gets high, turns on. So checking that while they're there, the reason to do that is, is so that the day that the pump fails and the water level starts to go up, that the alarm works that day, which is the most important day that it works. They should also just be walking out over your drain field. And we'll talk about this is something you as a property owner can do as well. But I find sometimes those inspection caps that are sticking up get hit by the lawnmower, right? So that's something they might even have a cap along where they can swap that out and fix that for you. Or let's say they happen to notice that a lot of the roof runoff from your garage is running on your septic. They should let you know about that. So. And it's not that that's probably something they can fix that day for you, but if they let you know that that's not a great idea, then you can decide moving forward how you're going to manage that. So believe it or not, there are devices out there that measure sludge and scum. So remember I showed, you know, the sludge and scum sitting on the bottom. Most of the time, if you hire someone to come out, they're going to clean your tank. But I would ask them the question of how dirty was it? Because some people go get it done every year. Some people go every two, three, four years. Um, it all goes back to use. There isn't a magic number. Our code does say you should look at it every three years to determine if it needs to be pumped. But when the guy shows up with this truck, guess, what's he, guess what he's going to do? Right? He's going to clean your tank out. But I do think there's valuable information that can come from that service visit of, again, how, in fact, dirty was your tank. And the easiest way to do that is, is with one of these devices that literally brings up a profile of the tank where they can measure how much sludge and scum were in it. The technical definition of when the tank needs to be pumped is if more than 25% of the depth. So for instance, many tanks have a four foot liquid depth, 48 inches. So when what happens over time is the sludge and scum builds up is you get less and less retention time for treatment. So our code says when you're above 25%, the tank should be cleaned. And if you're above a third, you went too long. And that's why if you did, let's say you were on the three-year interval and they come out and 40% of your tank is storing sludge and scum, you need to be on a two-year interval instead of a three-year interval. When you say clean, you're, you're 
Yes, uh, that's a good, uh, good question. Is cleaning and pumping the same thing? When they pump out your tank, they are removing a vast majority of the sludge and scum, but it is not clean. <laughs> but uh, they really are, in fact. I mean, I still think that the word clean is okay, but they're not sanitizing it. There's still a little good stuff in there to get the tank going again. So, so the goal is to remove the accumulated sludge and scum. It's done by someone who's licensed by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And it's, uh, this is what typically needs to happen with a lot of our older systems, is that that lid is buried, often 12 inches. That was very common for two reasons that I think did have some validity that, that I like to point out. One is, is people don't like to see them. That's not very valid because now we're going to bring them to grade. But why in the past it was because it was a safety issue is that, uh, again, this tank that has four to five feet of liquid in it, is something that a child could drown in, a pet could fall into. So it is important that that lid be secure. So the new concrete lids like you see here weigh 95 pounds. I can barely get them off. Like I just roll it a little over because I know I'm going to have to get it back on. They do also make, um, I would say, more aesthetically pleasing lids that are made of green, for instance, it looks like grass, that are fiberglass that have unique screws in them. But it's very important those be screwed in place. So it's going on a couple years ago now, but there was a toddler on the North Shore on one of those fiberglass lids, everybody out in the yard, all of a sudden they can find him. And it took them hours before they found the lid had flipped and it literally went back in place and he drowned in the tank. So it is, it is a dangerous thing in your backyard. So it needs to be secure because it is four to five feet of liquid that certainly a child could drown in. Yeah. Yes, there is an oxygen in there. So tanks have to be cleaned through the manhole. So if you don't have a manhole at grade, if it looks like this, it has to be dug up. It cannot be cleaned if all you see is a four or six inch hole. So will this hose fit in a four inch diameter opening? Yes. Will they get your tank cleaned out? No. What they will do is, is they will suck out the liquid and they will leave behind the sludge and scum. So you need to expose this. So it's really nice when you're man, that's why again, manholes are now required to be at grade, is to facilitate maintenance. So a couple more things about this picture. You can maybe tell there's a series of tanks. You can actually tell that this is where the pump is because there's a pedestal here where their electricity is coming. Um, and this is where the alarm is typically located for most people is out by their actual system. You can also see this homeowner put down some straw. So they were doing that for freeze protection. So obviously they were living there year round and were concerned about it freezing. The one thing I do like is that they're hauling it away. So you do want vegetation to grow there. And if you leave the straw there, then you won't be growing anything. So the other thing I want to point out is you should be getting a report when that pumper maintainer comes out to your property. That report, uh, these are the things that are literally listed in the code that should be on the report, when they were there, how many gallons they took out. But what I like to point out the most is if there's any safety concerns, is any troubleshooting or repairs that they either conducted or need to happen. This doesn't go to the county. They are not there being the septic police. They are there to give you information about your system. So that's, I think that's a really valuable bit of information. Every tank has a manhole. And again, there could be an exception. Let's go back to 1950. I think, I think we found uh, tanks from the 70s that didn't have manhole covered, but pretty much the early 80s on, they all have a manhole covered. You need to find it. So if you have been having it clean, so on most older tanks, it's in the middle. So not like the pictures I've shown where there's a manhole at each end. It's usually right in the center of the tank. So the easiest way for them to find that or for you to find it is to have some sort of impact probe, like just a pointy probe. They can probe around because your whole tank, the lid of the tank might be four feet in the ground. To, to get to the actual, let me see if I have a picture. Um, I think I have one coming up. But, um, to get, so, but what they did is they put a riser on it. And the riser comes up usually closer to the surface. So it, it could be that even though you just see this, if you go under that, 
in the middle, you will find a manhole. If you don't have one of these in the middle, and they usually have those probes with, it's a lot more work to dig them up, but it's the only way to get the tank clean. So, you find a So this is, again, if you look at this, um, I think in this picture, there isn't anything sticking up. So some people don't have anything, but so it may be that it could be as shallow as this, but it could be deeper. And that's where putting a riser on it makes sense. And the maintainer can do that too, if they are set up and most of them could add the riser. But what I will tell you is if you, when you do get that tank opened and actually access it, your tank will get way cleaner than it's been getting. Like you really haven't been getting your tank clean. Normally, the way they're anywhere from two to I would say six. I've seen them. Yeah, I don't. I don't. We don't like to see deep tanks. It's really hard to get those tanks clean. But I would say four foot is pretty. We're gonna pick an average number. Yeah. Okay, but I know there's been some things that are bell shaped rather than octagons or anything else. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a bell shape, more likely. Yeah, but even even the round ones. So the, I have, and when you say bell, I there are very few because they're formed usually precast. The new ones are all precast. They're not yeah. made of right. other but materials. Yeah, there are, yeah, there are some tanks that might more encourage that movement, but uh, because in a rectangular tank, it's definitely true, you're, it's going to be harder to get in the corners if you're not. But I, I will just tell you, our state code requires that all tanks for proper cleaning have to be cleaned through the manhole. And it actually requires that if you're not going to go through the manhole, that the homeowner signs off and says, I'm not really doing maintenance. That's in our code. I'm not saying that this was happening, but I'm telling you, like, we, it, it just, to me, to me, it is, a, it is actually a poor investment. It's, it's like half changing your oil or something. Like, you would, it, it just, you're not doing a proper job. Um, and, and it will, over time, potentially impact the longevity of your system. And I want people's systems to last as long as possible. So, yeah, um, so, yeah, I would say if you have one of those probes, you find the edge, like, unless it's too deep beyond the probe, then you start talking about a mini excavator, and that's a bummer. I mean, we will but, come out, but we'll at least talk to you over the phone and email you a copy of your article and say, look here, look between these two pipes and dig down, and you should find it. Right, and but based on the age of... Yeah, and that might be the, a lot of the older tanks have, uh, you can see in that picture right there, where an animal cover has the pipe. Yeah. Uh, the a lot of people are going to more than likely. Some of the systems that have the pipe is Yep. Right. Cool. Or it could, it could be that the inlet and outlet there. And it's also know. possible based on the era that your system was put in and who the tank manufacturer is, the local guys might know where your manhole is. Right. Like the guy who's cleaning your tank might know where it is, but didn't want to dig it out. So we can help you. Yeah. So that was that area. If you open up the guidebook, what should be from a person who. I also feel like this is not always happening either. You're getting a bill, right, that says pay, and I would say I'll be happy to pay the bill when I get my report. And I 
Yeah, a thousand is a very common size. Thing. The other thing that happens a lot during maintenance is the maintainer will come up and pump your tank and give you the receipt and says everything looks good. So the homeowner thinks my system just got inspected. This guy yeah. has certified license said it's okay, but now I, a year from now I sell my house and the county's telling me I need an inspection where I just had it inspected. And we tell you, well, that wasn't an inspection, that was maintenance. Right. There's confusion ensues. Yeah. Uh, so uh, maintainers are not set up to inspect those systems for a compliance inspection for a home sale. That's a different activity. Another question I did also ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I mean, the checklist of when it comes in and of what we want to know. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like, you know, like of like certified. Yes. Obviously, the speed dial number I have. Yeah. So if you call me, I'll give you. A, actually, it's on our website too. You can go to the NPCA, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's website, and they have a search engine that you can not only pick what county you live in, but you can pick what profession you're looking for. Whether it's a maintainer, yeah, so they're called maintainers, not hunters. So when you go to the list, you can say, Give me a list of all the maintainers in Otter Tail County, and you'll get a list of their name, their address, or, you know, their phone numbers. Anybody who's licensed in the state of Minnesota is on the But you can narrow it down to the county you live in. So when they do a clean out your tank, that is then called septage. It's got a whole set of regulations. The options are they can actually land apply it. Um, following federal requirements, or it can be taken to a wastewater treatment plant. Some people get concerned about when they think about this being put on fields, but just understand they're required to lime it, which raises the pH that kills off the vast majority of the bacteria. It's applied at ergonomic rates, so what the crops can uptake for the nutrients. There's setbacks, there's restrictions on grazing, and when you can remove the crops, it's much more regulated than the land application of manure, animal animal manure. So they have to be doing it right when it comes down to You don't want a sprinkler system over your septic system. People do it all the time, but okay, so when you put a septic system in a spot, you are putting hundreds of gallons of water there every day. So you are changing the hydrology of that soil. So we really don't want irrigation systems over it because we're already asking that soil to do a lot for us. Um, so it's just, you run the risk of hydraulically overloading how much water the soil can take. So it really shouldn't be. Um, people, like I said, I've seen people do it, but because they really want that even perfect lawn, but they, they're doing that at the expense of their septic system. I have a water softener slide coming up, so let me, I'll, I'll get to that one. So I think we, when you clean the screen, you can see it's important that you not run it out in your yard, right? That you're, they're cleaning it back into the tank um, itself. So how often do we need to have our tanks clean? When the sludge and scum build up, so the maximum time period without having the system looked at is three years. The rule of thumb then is somewhere between one to three years based on how you use your system. And this is true even if you have a seasonal home or cabin. Um, I've been at cabins that get used more in a weekend than some people use in a week, right? So, and keep in mind when they're there, some of the most, one of the more critical things they do when they open up your tank is check that those baffles are there. So what happens if at year one, your baffle fell off, which can happen? I don't want it to go forever, right? I want to actually know. I will point out that is another risk of cleaning a tank through those inspection ports because some of those pipes are right over your manhole or over your baffle and they can actually knock the baffle off when they're putting their hose in there. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It'll come back to you.
we have ours done every two weeks. And I've heard some people say they've never had it. <laughs> and they're proud of it. And they're proud of it. So there, um, I've seen tanks that have never been pumped, and they are just full of sludge and scum, and the liquid is traveling through. Yeah, so, water. so there's kind of two potential. So the the biggest thing is they uh, is some of those systems in where I grew up, which was a much more farming community. Many of those systems were hooked into a tie line, so they weren't going to the soil. But what they are doing is just decreasing the life of their system. So more solids are going to be going out to their drain. What's the best time of year to have that? Spring to fall, uh, so it, and it depends if they are land applying. So many of them will have not when it's too wet. You just you never want to do it in the winter. And when I say fall, if you if you live there particularly year round, you don't want that tank sitting empty going into winter because it takes many people a week or two to fill up the tank. So that means you have a long time period. Also, you don't want it sitting empty when you get a, uh, there's a risk of it sitting empty all the time too. Like, so let's say you're going to pump it before a fall and you're going to leave. Of the water table on that tank, there can actually be pressure on it. So I do know some people who do use their cabins during the winter pretty limitedly and they're worried about freezing. So they'll pump it out and fill it up over the winter. And if you're considering that, the question you just need to know is how deep is your tank and where is your actual water table? Some people don't have a, like a water table around their tank that could cause that. So, so anytime when it's warm in Minnesota is a good time to pump your tank. And we all know that's a pretty narrow window. So warmer is better. Um, the other reason warmer is better is that the bacteria will get better back up to speed when it's warmer versus cold. But a lot of tanks, though, we talked about being, you know, two, three, four feet in the ground. Our soil temperature at like five or six feet stays around 52 degrees year round, once you get below frost depth. So a lot of that tank is sitting in soil that doesn't change much either though. So it's, anyway, probably long answer to that. But. Do you need to put anything in your tank? The answer is no, that we are the food source. We are the bacteria source. And again, a picture I took at Home Depot, there has yet to date been a product on the market that has been shown to do, to have any benefit to septic systems. Maybe someday we will. I actually, you know, there are, particularly on the, in the big waste water treatment world, there are additives that have shown benefit, but we, we haven't in our industry seen a benefit from any of these. So to me, it's kind of like flushing 20s, so. I was gonna say, on like a drain cleaner. Um, we don't use drain cleaners, but there are from like enzyme-based, yeah, I, I would say overall, you shouldn't need any sort of cleaner in your system. They're just, um, if you have a, pl a clog in a pipe, which is why most people use drain cleaners, is that they're worried that, you know, something's running slow and I'm going to put something down there. Most of that stuff is really harsh stuff. It's designed to eat away hair and grease. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would just say overall, whenever I see a product like that, my question is, is there any third party research that shows it does any good? Because it could just be, because I can't, I'm not saying it necessarily is harming your system, but it might just not be necessary. So I've never seen any chemicals yeah, I, I would, I mean, there's just so much bacteria in wastewater. Um, and, and, and again, I have yet to find a product that actually has, that has any sort of research that supports their claims. So, so the state says, particularly the ones that say, if you use this product, you don't need to clean your septic tank. Those are the ones that are banned. Well, I think what the code says is you can't use it in lieu of regular maintenance. If you use them, you still have to maintain your, your system at a three-year interval. The state code says you have to have your system looked at every three years to determine if it needs to be pumped. It does not say pumped. And it says you can't use a product in lieu of tank pumping. You can't. I mean, that's what it comes to. Yeah, so, so do the maintainers uh, take records? 
They're required to keep records. Some jurisdictions are now actually requiring that that be submitted to the county. I don't think that's where Otter Tail is yeah, at we're, now. Yeah, we're, we're probably a few years from that. Um, that's something uh, a lot of counties do, and we'll be modeling our um, tracking based on what some other counties have done. It's a very simple thing to do. Um, in fact, it'll get to the point where a pumper can a pumper can go on his iPad or a smartphone, say, I'm at this address, I pump this many gallons, hit submit, and we get that record, and we have a database of all the pumping activity. But we're a few years off from that. Okay, I thought, we thought that was already happening. Yeah. I think we're sending information to They you. are, uh, but they're not required to. Not so it's, it's voluntary at this point. So the pump, if you have a pump in your system, that pump will need to be replaced and it could be on December 25th. So when they're out there uh, maintaining your system, if you have a pump tank, it's good for them to open that lid and do a few things. One, you can get some sludge buildup in that tank and you do not want the pump to turn on and pump sludge out to your system. But they also should confirm that the pump will be removable when needed. So that means accessible from grade, that it's not sitting on the bottom of your tank, it's actually sitting on a block. Um, it's replaceable, it's operable, and it's alarmed. So just confirming that the pump is working properly during your service visit. And the newer systems are Right, so there's lots of even new systems today uh, that are gravity flow that don't have pumps. But I would say more and more, it's getting more and more common that people have a pump in their system. So how do you go about hiring a pumper or a maintainer? Certainly, word of mouth, people who've had positive experience with people is always good. So this is the list uh, Chris was mentioning. So if you just type this into Google, that search engine we were talking about comes up. So you don't even, because it's a long address, I don't even know what it is, but anytime I go to it, and then you're either gonna select, depending who you're looking to hire, a maintainer is who cleans tanks, um, and then keep in mind, it is orientated by the county that they reside in. And I have yet to find, oh, that's not true. I did find one maintainer who tells me he only works in one county, but he works in St. Louis County. If you know what that county looks like, it's giant. <laughs> so most people in this industry do cross county lines. So particularly if you're close, if your property is close to a border, you could look at your neighboring counties as well. And then you can ask them questions. We all like to start with the question on the bottom, right? We're looking for a deal. But if you're talking about the difference of $25, right? And they're not gonna dig up your manhole, it's not worth it. And I will tell you that a good maintainer is going to charge you more if they have to dig, right? That's time and time is money. The one thing that if you are trying to save money, you can do is dig it up yourself, right? That That's what it's gonna come down to is one way or another, there, uh, and but that would be at a time, and I completely agree with Chris that adding a riser, the time to do it, if, you, if that is deep, is during this visit. So you could ask them other questions, right? Are they going to pump through the manhole? Do they own a sludge judge? Do they back flush? Do they want to sell you an additive, right? And certainly economics do factor, but I often find in markets that you usually are talking about the difference of $25 or $50 on something that costs a couple hundred dollars, right? This isn't this isn't a super expensive thing that you're doing every two or three years. So over your soil treatment area, I mentioned those cracked or inspection pipes, looking at where the rain and snow runoff goes, um, and just annually taking a look at it. So many people can see their drain field every day, right? It's in your front yard, backyard. Sometimes it's back over there, right? You don't really see it. And that's something just to keep an eye on it to make sure that there aren't any problems, that a, that, you know, a family of gophers didn't move in. Right? So the basics of your drain field are it needs to breathe. It needs oxygen. So compaction is bad. So you want to keep anything heavy off of it. So vehicles, certainly. Animals, and again, I have a St. Bernard, so he probably has a pretty big pounds per square inch, but what I'm really talking about is horses, right, cattle. It's not a great place to put a salt lick on top of your mound for the deer, right, because they're going to come there all the time, and when they do that, they're going to compact, even though they're not super large animals. So, um, Inspection pipes, if you do have them, I'm a big fan of irrigation boxes for two reasons. One, I hate when septic systems do look like eyesores in people's beautiful yards. So you can cut those off, 
put an irrigation box on it with a nice green lid, have it blend better into your property. And then it probably won't get hit with the lawnmower too if it's flush with the surface. You don't wanna bury them though. They're there for a reason. Um, so, but by, at, at grade. So newer mounds or systems that are pressurized that have pumps in them have something different. So in the past, we just had an inspection for it over our drain field. And the purpose of that is to measure water level. Is there water building up in our system? The new systems actually have a, a smaller diameter pipe and it has a little elbow on the end and it actually has the ability to clean out the lines and flush them. If you hit those with the lawnmower, you now have a little mini faithful every time your pump comes on of sewage squirting up in your yard. So those are ones you do not want to hit. And if you hit them or the box that they're in, you just want to make sure you, you fix that. But this was a great feature that was added in because if you think about a pipe sitting empty between doses, it tends to grow bacteria over time. So it's a, it's a good function that we've added in. So here is, these are those green inspection pipes, kind of a little hard to see in this picture with the dappled sun, but he's actually, this is a startup and he, the water is actually squirting up. That's, and so those lines could be open, that's just a hole now and we can literally flush it out once the system is operating. But what we should and what we recommend over drain fields is just turf grass. And the biggest reason for that is turf grass can handle drying out. It can handle periods of drought and it kind of gets back to the irrigation question. We don't want to plant anything over the top that needs a lot of continual watering, which is why gardens aren't a good idea, like a vegetable garden. Could you do other things like perennials and things like that? And the answer is you could, but keep in mind, a little watering in the beginning is fine, right? We always need to water to get stuff going, but we would want to plant things that could handle time periods when it is drier. Um, the question, are you allowed to see your just because the roots tend to go very much deeper than turf grass? Yeah, um, I have had, I've seen properties that do. Um, I always tell people too, they can't do a control burn over their septic system. But this is, that's not a good idea because we do are gonna have some plastic components that are pretty shallow. Um, the other reason I don't like native prairie is because you have to manage a native prairie. Um, and some people are, if you're super into that, great, but you can't just plant it and walk away. Because if you do, I guarantee you five years from now, you'll have brush, you'll eventually have trees. And that is what we really need to avoid. The biggest problem for septic systems is things that have a woody root structure, because uh, eventually those roots are gonna keep growing and they're gonna try their darndest to get into our system. I, that, I mean, we should, all the pipes should be tight, things shouldn't, but it, over time, so we never want to plant anything woody over the top of the system. If you want to, again, at a distance, and I always say to people, they want to plant any sort of trees near their system is one. Think about how big that tree's going to get. And the best trees to plant at a distance are smaller ornamental trees, right? You want to put a new, you know, dwarf honeycrisp 20 feet from your septic? I don't care. You want to plant an oak tree? that tree's gonna get 100 feet tall, right? So just thinking about what you plant. And we often are gonna end up having trees close to our septic system, right? That's just the world we live in. But if we're gonna plant new trees, we should think about what, what we're planting. So what I mentioned is you could frame the system with trees and shrubs at a distance. If I'm planting a new tree, I would never plant anything closer than 20 feet. But keep in mind, there are trees that are also known to be pretty aggressive. Uh, poplar, maple, maple, willow is the one we all think of, but even elm trees, at least 50 feet is recommended. And it's better if your septic system gets sunlight. That's not what all of our, where all of ours look, but if I can get sunlight on it, I'm going to get better evapotranspiration the warmer months. So we do have a nice fact sheet on our website, and I'm going to have a list of websites at the end here, but the word septic system in University of Minnesota, we have a ton of resources um, on our website. So problems again, here's the coffee can, here's a drain field growing nothing, which either tells me they didn't plant anything or it got compacted and isn't growing anything. Uh, certainly keeping four wheelers, mounds or not snowmobile jumps right off of our system. So. From the lake, so uh, it depends on your lake. So the minimum setback from a lake, if you have a general development lake, is 50 feet. So generally speaking, general development lakes are lakes that have 
lots of development around them. As the lake gets more pristine, either because of its history or because of its current use, the setback increases. So, so then it can go um, up 75, 100. So those classifications are set by the DNR, right, Chris? Yeah. Like those, the, and sometimes it is a little surprising, like you can't just be guaranteed because there's a lot of houses or no houses. Like it isn't always as black and white, but that's the general. But keep in mind also, um, in past activities could influence that too. Um, it's not always, like I said, it's not always as black and white. So the last thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna walk through uh, your home and talk about things you can do to extend the life of your septic system based on how you and your family and sometimes your guests, right, who are staying with you use the system. So things we, we can do to extend the life of the septic system and protect the environment. So the first one is just to think about how we use water. And I would say the biggest thing is actually like, like also not just conserving, but not using it all at one time. So I remember my old house, you couldn't flush the toilet and take a shower at the same time because it affected the water pressure. Now my new house, I can have everything going, right? I can be running the dishwasher while we're doing laundry, while both of us are taking a shower. Well, that would be a very different water usage. So also it's not just how much, it's even when you use it. So not doing Saturday laundry day is the best example. Could you do a couple loads every day instead of 20 loads on the weekend? Things like that. So. Be mindful of the products you use and limit the cleaners. Oh yeah, that's a really nice picture of a baffle. So uh, for those of you online, we had a very long baffle conversation. So what you'll notice here is that there's a big gap between the pipe and that. And if there isn't, that plugs up. So and this is the scum layer. This is a, a very mature scum layer sitting on top. Not everybody will have something this thick. So think about the products we use. Do not use your system as a garbage can. So uh, I was at a national conference a couple years ago and I was standing waiting for my Uber to go to the airport and the, the bellhop guy was talking to me up and asked me what I was there for and I told him and he's like, well, if you could give me one piece of advice, what would it be? And I said, well, it's this. Like, don't use your toilet, which is the biggest problem. Don't use your toilet like a garbage can. And he said, oh, no, 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 it's okay. I use the flushable wipes. He was being completely sincere with me. He thought, and this is, this is a huge marketing, it was a huge marketing problem in our country. Because this was, isn't a problem just for septics, it's a problem for municipal. And I've seen these big blobs of wipes and grease. And, and so um, that was a huge education problem was created because people thought it was okay to flush things like that. So things that do not degrade cannot go down our toilets because they're just going to accumulate in the septic tank. That's what it's going to come down to. So, and if you have a problem, don't wait for sewage in your basement. People do. Like people sometimes know that their septic system is squishy or they occasionally catch a weird whiff, but they wait and that waiting can cause bigger problems. And now you don't have time to plan for it. You need a new septic system now. So when we look at the products you use in your house, the number one problem is things that are sanitizers. We have, and this was pre-COVID, this is not a new talk, we have become a society that wants to sanitize a lot more than we used to. And so a little bit of sanitizer is fine. A lot of things that kill bacteria are bad for our septic system. Antibiotic soaps and wipes are, are used in 75% of American households. And these products have a cumulative impact. It's not one thing. I can't go into anyone's house and say, that's it. It's often homes that have a lot of that going on. So, so products are labeled, but they're not labeled for septic systems. They're labeled for public health. So I remember when I was a kid, we'd put a Mr. Yuck symbol on things. You remember those? I, I, they don't exist anymore. But that meant I was going to the hospital if I swallowed it. That's the worst stuff. And I remember we used a product called Iron Out. It would just melt away the iron, but you didn't want to breathe it and you didn't want it to touch your skin. Not good for your septic system. So we want to choose as many products as possible that would be more on this end, that are the least toxic. And if it's the least toxic for our health, it's going to be the least toxic for our septic system. 
So a great resource for this is the Environmental Working Group. This is a nonprofit organization that has a comprehensive website which rate, rates a full range of household products. So you can look up the product you're using right now and it'll get an A, B, C, D, or F. If it gets a C or below, I would say I wouldn't be putting it in my septic system. But it could also be you're like, oh, well, what are all the A laundry detergents, right? Um, so this is for public health and the environment, both of those. And it's not even just cleaners, they even do like all kinds of, all kinds of things that, that are um, in general around your home. The question we're now plant-based, so are they necessarily safe? Um, all, I would tell you that 99% of things that you see on the outside of a container is marketing. So, I mean, I do feel better. I'm just going to tell you honestly that if, it's, if it uh, is labeled green or biodegradable, but I'll tell you that website doesn't care about any of that. They look at what are the active ingredients. Um, all products are, uh, well, I would say most products are required to have safety data sheets that explain, like, is there any, like, there's a lot of fragrances out there that a lot of people, for instance, have, like, huge allergic reactions to. I mean, it's generally people who are more sensitive to that sort of stuff. So, like, they look at it. And to me, it's interesting because the difference between, like, plant-based or petroleum-based, is that a huge distinction for the septic system? I, you know, that gets to be, it gets to be complicated. So I, I can't say that just being plant-based guarantees that it's better or worse, mainly because no one's controlling. There is no marketing EPA group that verifies that, that, that it's better is what I'm more getting at. So, so how much water? Well, our code lays out for most homes, 150 gallons per bedroom. That assumes two people per bedroom. So most homes are not used at that capacity, but we have to somehow figure out like how many people reasonably, because the issue is if you sell your property tomorrow, we can't just design it for who lived in the house then. We have to design for basically what the normal high-end occupancy would be. But if you look at the average person, we use 50, 60 gallons a day. That's about where we average. So then if you're an average person, 28,000 gallons of water a year which kind of sounds like a lot of water to me. And now if you take a household that has three people in it, that's about 70,000 gallons of water a year. Because as you add people, it's not exactly linear. Now take your lake, right, or your township with 250 septic systems, that's 15 million gallons of water a year. And that water from your septic system is either going into your groundwater or moving laterally to your lake. 15 million gallons a year, that's a lot of water. So that's why it's really important that we have good septic systems that are properly managed. So where do we use this water? Most of it is used in the bathroom. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, some, some things we can do in each of these rooms. You'll see then laundry. This one is always disheartening to me, how much water is lost in the average home just due to leaks. And finally, the smallest user there, about 11% um, in the kitchen. So looking at the toilet, if this is what your bathroom looks like, both your realtor and your septic system would like you to remodel, right? Because this toilet, every time it flushes, is using five to seven gallons of water. It's the number one water user in your home. So if you were going to look, cut back on water usage, the biggest thing you could do would be to replace your, your toilet with a low flow version. They're now at 1.28 gallons or less. Interestingly, last year I went uh, on vacation to Portugal. And Portugal is actually surprisingly a pretty rural country because it's on the edge of Europe. And while I was in Portugal for 10 days, I did not once use a toilet that wasn't dual flush. And it made me just think why, why that trend or that, I guess it's more of a technology, has never caught on in the U.S., but it hasn't. <laughs> but of course, I put a new toilet in my house, right? It's dual flush because I do septic work, right? Because I thought about it. And I think another problem with some of those toilets in the past, the low-flow toilets, is they weren't very effective. Sometimes people would have to flush more than once just to, to deal with things. So, But the, the technology in that way has definitely um, gotten a lot better. The other big problem with toilets is the running, right? If you've ever had to jiggle the handle to get it to seat properly. Um, a leaky toilet can be hundreds or thousands of gallons if it's actually open. So. 
So the recommended toilet cleaner is not your dog, right? Um, so the biggest thing about toilets is that you do not want to constantly sanitize them. So in the past, this would always make your toilet bowl blue, right? That you would have that blue sanitizer every time you flush, but now they even make, you put a blob on the side of the bowl, so every time you flush, you're sanitizing. That's bad for your septic system because it's a constant addition of a sanitizer. So for most people, a little elbow grease, basically a brush is really what you need. And sometimes you might need a little cleanser or if you have hard water, um, I found that um, uh, for that, sometimes uh, hot vinegar will actually do it, barkeeper's friend, a pumice stick, a shaw pad, something other than using a really harmful um, chemical. So what should go in the toilet bowl? Toilet paper, no lotions, no wipes, human waste, nothing else. And if you ever wanna know if your toilet paper that you like is okay, put it in a jar with water and shake it. And when you do that, the toilet paper should start breaking down. If you do that with a wipe, nothing happens, right? Cause it's not. So um, I've had a few uh, maintainers in particular that have told me that they have had a couple of the quadruple ply, super thick stuff that isn't breaking down well, but it also might go back to the volume also sometimes that homes are going through, but the toilet paper should be breaking down. So what about this? I, I don't like this word one bit because it's just like your question about things that say they're plant-based, is if it says it's septic safe, what does that mean? It's just marketing. No one's regulating it. My least favorite one was, uh, I don't know if it's still out there, but a couple years ago there was kitty litter that said it was septic safe. Usually what this means is it's flushable, right? Is that it'll pass through your toilet. That does not mean it's good for your septic system or better with the toilet paper because there's a lot of toilet paper that's labeled um, septic safe. So moving into your shower, fixing leaks, using low flow fixtures, They've gotten a little better too. Avoiding constantly sanitizing your shower. Uh, shower sprays have gotten more common where people are spraying down their shower after every shower. And that, uh, again, it's just a constant sanitizing. Um, avoid antibacterial soaps. Again, the time and place for antibacterial soap is when you are outside and you cannot access hot water and soap. But hot soapy water is actually more effective than a lot of the sanitizing products because it literally is evaporating off of you. It's, it's, it's even if you look at CDC recommendations, they say whenever you can, you should actually be washing your hands and not with an antibacterial product. Um, limit shading and bath oils. It doesn't say any, but um, I've had people ask me lately about Epsom salt baths or that they wanna put a massage, uh, like an oil into their bath. And it's not to say doing any of those things once, but I, got, I had a lady say every night her husband is taking a salt bath. This kind of gets up the water softener conversation we're gonna have. A little bit of salt isn't bad, a lot of salt isn't a good idea. So it all goes back to moderation. Bar soap is better than liquid only because you use less and the less soap going out. But um, if you have one of those foaming ones, I think you're still probably a little bit minimizing the amount of soap you're so we had a little conversation about drain cleaners. The best thing uh, for keeping your drains clean is stopping stuff from going down the drain. So whether this be food particles, hair is notorious for clogging uh, pipes because it catches all kinds of other soaps. And so if you can catch more of it, that's the best. Uh, when drains do clog, particularly for sinks, it's often right below the sink. Uh, so we, uh, we went on a trip and we had a friend of ours stay at our house while we went out of town to take care of the animals, right? So we come back from the trip and our kitchen drain is draining really slow. And this is my husband's friend, which is important, right? So I text him and I'm like, Mick, was the drain running really slow? And he goes, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, I processed a deer. I, that was the not pleasant drain to take apart because it was a bunch of congealed fat and hair and all of that that had been sitting for several days in my sink. He's like, I did leave you some venison in the freezer. I'm like, well, it's almost worth it at that point. But So I, it wasn't a hard fix though. I just had to take it apart, right? So that's often where the problem is. If it's further down, that's where you need a snake, right? So you may have one of those or you may have to um, have someone come out. 
There are some DIY solutions for almost everything I'm talking about. And I always say, if you can eat it, it's, it's, it's relatively safe for your septic system. So a half a cup of salt and a half a cup of baking soda isn't going to ruin your system. I can't guarantee, depending what the clog is, though, um, that it's going to resolve the problem. So moving on to your washing machine, this is another uh, location you can really cut back on water. Um, old washing machines, again, 30, 40 gallons a load. New ones, you'll see 12 to 20. Uh, so using a lot less water, they get your clothes drier, so you save on electricity. And we really do want to think about spreading out our loads. Another thing to consider is actually adding a lint filter. So there is more lint coming off in your washer than in your dryer. So we all clean our lint trap on our dryer, right? Anyone have one on their washer? I actually installed one of these and I'm amazed. So it's just my husband and I, we feel that we have to empty it every week. And it's not, it, it's just the lint and it's it's kind of, it's more, I would say dense than the lint that comes out of your dryer because it's it's wet. So if you, if you, so these are aftermarket, this one is actually a Minnesota company. It's uh, sold here in Minnesota. But there's, there's a couple other brands that are out on the market. I have seen people are doing research, trying to have something you would put in your washing machine that would literally catch it while it's in there that you would empty. If you have a something a setup like this, you could try the putting a screen or a pantyhose on it. That seems like a lot of messing around to me in the long run. But we don't really know what's happening to this lint. But if you think about it, there are little fibers, right, as they're coming off your clothing. And there is a risk that some of those fibers won't settle out in your septic tank and could make it out to your drain field. So here's the problem. If you have heavy usage all at one time, is you may not have a nice quiet environment and that can stir up sludge and scum in your tank. So when it comes to laundry soap, uh, you just want to limit bleach usage. Uh, keep in mind, so I just bought a thing of laundry soap right on the front. It says it does 100 loads take off the cap, it's giant. I cannot even hardly see the line. Because by the time I bought the soap, they're like, use as much as you want, right? The more soap you use, the next you'll buy it. So if you, particularly if you have soft water, I recommend you start with half of what they recommend and see, are your clothes getting clean? So be careful if you're buying really cheap powdered products. Some of those contain clay as a filler. And we do not want little, little, little clay particles don't settle out well and plug up your drain. Um, do not use liquid fabric softeners. Uh, they've been shown to affect the stratification of a tank. So there's kind of two options there. One would be to use a dryer sheet instead. Uh, the other thing is just to not use them at all. I mean, those are petroleum-based products. The reason why your clothes feel soft is you're literally feeling like a layer of petroleum that's coating uh, your uh, clothing. So baking soda, vinegar, dryer balls, aluminum foil balls, those are more natural approaches. So moving into the kitchen, this is the latest question I've had uh, about is about all those pods we're using. They've gotten a lot more common. So those are basically a plastic based material that is right. It gets wet and it basically melts away. Um, I, we don't have any data that says that's a bad idea. Why I don't like them is you have no ability to control how much soap you're putting into anything. When it's in a pot right so and the other part of me that doesn't like it is the german in me that uh wants to uh, save money and they're more expensive you're paying for the convenience of having it in a pod so i, I would say to date i can't say they're causing problems with your septic but there is some concern about what that material is <laughs> dishwashing very small amount of water use in our home but the biggest thing is this any, you know, fats and oils should not be going down the drain. Um, we're going to talk about garbage disposals here. So garbage disposals take big things and they make them into tiny little pieces. Tiny little pieces don't settle out as well. So I, in general, if you have one, use it as little as possible. We do design for them, meaning if you have a garbage disposal in your house, you're actually required to make your septic tank larger to deal with the extra solids load. So in theory, your system should, should be able to handle it. But I was once at a friend's house and she was cleaning out her kitchen, um, her refrigerator, and all of the food that they weren't, that they were throwing away was going in her sink. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, put in your garbage, put in your compost, put it somewhere. Don't put that all down the drain. So, so a couple other things, things that shouldn't go into your septic system. Your sump pump or tie line. 
dehumidifier discharge. I don't know in our climate if this is that much water, but this, this, this actually came from a national side. So you think if you live in a state like Texas, that could be a lot more water. So I, again, I think that's a relatively small amount. This high efficiency furnace discharge, we had this in originally because people who leave in the winter and leave their furnace on have had freezing problems. I attended a conference last year in Alberta. That water is also very acidic. Like it literally is, has a very low pH. Uh, so if you're not there and you're sending a bunch of acid water out to your septic system, also not good. So it's better if it be routed out. If you have to have it connected because of the way it's laid out and you're having freezing issues, you just need to put a small pump in so that it's not a trickle of water um, at one time. So other things, again, roof runoff, the dripping faucets, the running toilets, anything that's clean that you haven't contaminated. So what about the water softener? So what I will say is the less chloride in your septic system, the better. I mean, that's sodium chloride, potassium chloride. Those are the two most common. Uh, chloride just isn't good for bacteria. So what we recommend is if you have an older unit, and the older units are usually called timer units, they're installed to regenerate every so many days. Those use a lot more salt. That's what it comes down to. So if you have an old timer unit, uh, you want to replace it. Um, also, you should have your water softener set appropriately for your hardness. So this means, and your water usage. A lot of the times people, if, particularly if they install their own, or sometimes even if they have a plumber, they tend to over soften their water, which means they're, it's, it's regenerating more than it needs to and using more salt. So if it is possible, it is better to have this routed out. Um, our septic code does not define that water as sewage, but I just know it very commonly is plumbed in because it's the easiest place for it to go. Um, but if you could have it out of the system, there's no regulations that prohibit that and it would be better for your septic system. Um, other water treatment devices, iron filters are better, best diverted out of the septic system. They actually form an iron precipitate, an iron solid which has the risk if it gets out to the soil of plugging it up. Reverse osmosis systems, I just talked to a designer, and if you know where Medina is, and he said people are putting entire home reverse osmosis systems, even for the water they're using to irrigate their lawn, because they don't want their sidewalks getting stained by iron. These are people that have different problems than me. And, and if you route that to your septic system, even the efficient ones are two to one meaning two gallons of wasted water for every gallon of treated water. Your septic system can't handle it. If you're doing a small under the sink unit, no problem, right? That's just drinking water. But if you were doing something larger than that, it really can't go into your septic system. So for those of you in person today, you have one of these in front of you. Um, for those of you who are listening online, if you uh, go into the county anytime soon, they'd be happy to give you a copy of this if you'd really like a copy of the slides as well, um, we're happy to share them with the county. So um, you can just reach out to, to Chris LeClaire if you're looking for that. So kind of a wrap up of, of this, and this picture is probably a little hard to see, but ultimately all of our water is connected. So wherever you're sitting today, you drank something, right? It had water, it was mainly water, even though it was coffee, right? And what I always like to think about is, has that water been used before? Absolutely. And will it be needed to be used again? Absolutely. So we need to make sure that our water, our limited amount, right? 3% of our water on our planet is fresh water and we are recycling it over and over again. So we need to make sure that that's safe. So again, what we can do is we can think about how much water we use. We can properly operate our septic system and our well. Um, properly dispose of unused pharmaceuticals and hazardous waste. And finally, because you're listening, you're already doing this last one, but it's also talking to your neighbors, right? Talking among your, if you have a lake association, um, about the issues that, and how important protecting our water is. So the last thing is the well testing kits. Uh, Chris went over this a little bit, I'm going to hit it again. The big thing is we have the kits today, and they're going to have them all week available to pick up at the county. Uh, the biggest thing is we have they have to be, and the, the reason for the one pickup day 
is because particularly the bacteria sample has to be picked up and get to the lab that day. So um, technically the pickup is at 10. Chris said 10. I said, well, shoot for 945. Because if, if you show up at 10 and he, he shows up right then, we might miss each other. So you just need to read the instructions. Um, and if you have any questions, again, you can directly call. And all of this, you can Google and find what, what the phone number is. Um, you can reach out to them if you do have any questions. But it's just going to be at the general desk. These kits are about $50, $60 worth of value. They're free. You get the results emailed to you within about, I think it's within a week of them receiving it. So it's a really quick turnaround time. So, so additional resources, uh, if you're looking for more information about wells, this is the university website. I did put an, e an EPA link about if you're more interested about chemicals of emerging concern. And a lot of these are on the back sheet of that back sheet um, as well, those websites. Just another question. Sure. Is yeah, and I'm not a chemist. I'm an engineer by training, so I'm not sure exactly what that reaction is. I've never done that myself, um, so I'm not sure if it'll work. But and and I ha like and it was getting back to the whole the whole thing about salt too. Is I mean. We excrete a ton of salt, right? We eat a lot of salt. We don't need it. So our wastewater has salt in it. So I ha I'm not worried about a half a cup of salt, but I'm, I'm sure that was based on some sort of trying to eat away at things. Do you think vinegar and salt or vinegar and baking No, vinegar and baking salt. Isn't that what they use to make the little science fair volcanoes? Yeah. yeah. So vinegar and baking soda is an online do-it-yourself recipe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. Anything that I always say, if you literally could eat it, it's way better for your septic system. I'm not advocating that anyone eat a half a cup of salt or a half a cup of baking soda, but in small amounts, right, we can, things we can consume that would make us sick are much easier for the environment to be able to treat and be able to. Yeah, so lemon juice, vinegar, right, all those sorts of things. Yeah. There are two people online. Um, uh, none of them are asking any questions. If you want to ask them real quick, if they have any questions, they can. Yeah, and I can you recording this too, so people yeah. can watch it later. Yes. I know most, I'm very happy you guys gave up your Saturday morning. <laughs> it's, it's rough when people are at the lake sometimes. So yeah, if you have any questions, you can type them in now, or you can always reach out. And Chris, I don't have, what's your email address? Uh, well, my number is 218-998-8105. I don't know how well you're making up, but. but I think with that, we're good. And if you guys want to keep them you as you're heading out, we'll do that. And there right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thank Thanks for being online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you just, just got to make sure that they seal it. Um, so when they when they take out the manhole, you'll have kind of a little recess lip. And we got to put some rubber mask on before they put the riser on, or we'll have a weak point. And then kind of rain, all the rain water is going to go into the tank. So go now, and have a lot of like five Which website is going to go to again? Google MPCA and SPS search. Google that.
So if you're not there anymore, uh, yeah, maybe you're all. That's okay. Have a good rest of the weekend. Yeah. Well, then. Oh, never officially. Last year. Yeah. Yeah. Who was it? I gotta stop this recording. Very informative. Thank you very much.